Hello, all, and thank you so much for being here. Um, two patents, book study series, structured literacy intervention, teaching, teaching reading difficulties to students in grades K to six. We are very excited to be with you again this evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Pam Kastner, and I have the honor of serving as patent state lead for literacy. And joining from the patent literacy team this evening is Andrew Bell, who is our Eastern Regional Literacy Lead. So I'll give you a little wave there. And then from our central office, Karen Deary. Nice to have such wonderful teammates here. Um, we're very excited this evening to be diving into chapter seven, structured literacy interventions for oral language with Dr. Richard Zippoli. We're very excited to have him here. Um, in the chat, we have placed the link to the uh, resources related to this series. There is a Padlet with all the recordings and resources that are found on the Patent Literacy Resource Hub. We'll be placing that chat into the chat over the course of our uh, evening. And we hope that you not only visit our book study series, but also the wonderful resources that the team has created as well on the Literacy Resource Hub. And now I'm going to turn it over to Karen Deary, who is going to share Dr. Zippoli's bio. Welcome, good evening. It's my honor to introduce our chapter seven presenter for this evening. Dr. Richard Zippoli is an associate professor and clinical instructor in the Department of Communication Disorders at Southern Connecticut State University. He received a PhD in the Department of Educational Psychology at the University of Connecticut with a program of study in special education emphasizing learning and reading disabilities. Dr. Zippoli also holds graduate degrees in communication disorders and physical therapy, as well as certification in assistive technology. He was awarded the Connecticut State University's Board of Regents 2018 Teaching Award for the Southern Connecticut State University and the Systems Wide Teaching Award. Dr. Zippoli, welcome. Thank you. Okay, um, so are you still able to hear and see me? Yes, we are. Good, okay, so we're all set for uh, technology. Um, I want to start by thanking uh, Dr. Kastner and her colleagues for the invitation to be with you tonight. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I also want to, let me just see here. There we go. Acknowledgement. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Louise Spear Swirling. Uh, for the opportunity to make a contribution to her wonderful book on structured literacy interventions. Uh, and my co-author, uh, Dr. Donna Merritt, who wrote the book with, uh, wrote the chapter with me. Uh, so my gratitude to them as well. So what I want to do is just start our discussion tonight by situating us in terms of these three common profiles of uh, readers that have reading difficulties. And uh, I was told beforehand that Louise has presented to you on chapter one. So hopefully uh, this will be a, a quick review. So we have students with specific word recognition difficulties. Um, these are kids that have difficulty extracting uh, or basically code based reading difficulties so difficulty was with word reading, but their broad oral language skills are relatively intact. Second group is our readers with a specific reading comprehension uh, difficulties or uh, deficit. Um, and this sort of inverts the profile of specific word reading difficulties with children with specific reading comprehension difficulties, what we tend to see is kids who can read the words, but don't have the broader oral language foundations to necessarily understand those words that they're reading aloud. Um, and then, of course, we have this third profile. There we go, of a mixed reading difficulties. And as I'm guessing most of you know, if you've been participating in this series and you've looked at the book, uh, these are children with both difficulties with word reading uh, or word recognition 
and broader oral language competency. So the work that we're going to be doing tonight is, is I'm going to focus on oral language weaknesses. If you think back to the simple view of reading, okay, so we have reading comprehension is equal to a student's word reading abilities, part of which is decoding, and then their broader listening or language comprehension. Um, and that's where we're going to be more focused tonight is on that listening and language comprehension piece. And that is going to be most relevant for children with this profile of specific reading comprehension difficulties and children with mixed reading difficulties, which is a lot of the children that we'll see out there. So uh, this is a partial list of areas of oral language that could be compromised uh, among re uh, students with reading difficulties. Uh, morphology and vocabulary, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on tonight because there are dedicated chapters in the Structured Literacy Intervention book on those topics, but I want to acknowledge they they certainly uh, could be uh, considered building blocks of oral language skills. Um, where I am going to focus most tonight is on syntax and narrative comprehension, and particularly syntax for reasons that I'll share with you in a moment. Um, also in the chapter that Donna and I uh, co-wrote together, Chapter 7, we do talk a little bit about inferencing skills and figurative language. And then, of course, background knowledge and pragmatics also contribute to oral language comprehension. So there's a lot of strands to oral language comprehension. Um, and given our time uh, uh, period we have together tonight, I'm going to have to be a little bit judicious and I've decided to focus primarily on syntax uh, and then a little bit on narrative comprehension as time allows. Okay, um, one of the things that Donna and I presented in our chapter uh, are some guiding principles for work as, uh, working to support oral language comprehension. And there are four of them we talked about in the outset of the chapter. One is to integrate skills across more, uh, multiple language modalities. And by that, I mean, we might be working on both uh, speaking and listening. Uh, in the parlance of speech and language pathologists, we might say both. Uh, expressive and receptive language in the oral mode. And then, of course, reading and writing. Um, and by working across these different modalities, uh, we're able to reinforce children's skills uh, in a, uh, a, a, a way that I think is more powerful than just focusing on one modality alone. And as we go on tonight, uh, uh, you'll see some examples of what that might look like. Second big idea, a focus on literate language and curriculum-based intervention. Uh, so other terms you might hear that overlap with literate language, academic discourse, um, teacher talk, Essentially, the features of literate language are that it tends to be more decontextualized than everyday conversational discourse. So uh, what do I mean by decontextualized language? It means one of two things. Uh, it is either removed in place or time Think of a history lesson, for example. Uh, often you're spe speaking about things that are from the past, that are remote in time. Uh, or uh, the other uh, feature of decontextualized language is that it might be focused on information that children are not familiar with. After all, it's a big part of why children go to school is to 
uh, learn about topics that are not uh, already familiar with, uh, to them. Uh, and the nature of literate language is it is more complex than everyday conversation. The sentences tend to be longer and more complex. For example, in written passages or in uh, if a child a child was given a, a writing prompt and asked to come up with a persuasive essay. Uh, generally, you're going to see longer, more complex languages, at least in typically developing children. Um, the other features of literate language, more complex and abstract vocabulary, um, more use of figurative language, um, and uh, more use of discourse genres such as expository or informational discourse and as i have already mentioned persuasive discourse might be examples of literate language uh, so that's going to be a big focus of the work that we're going to do uh, for children with difficulties with oral language comprehension Another theme that we'll come back to later on in the presentation is narrative skills in particular are considered a gateway that helps bridge children's, let's say, proficiency with everyday conversational skills and helps move them toward proficiency or success with more literate language including higher level discourse genres, such as expository uh, writing or reading expository text, um, understanding and writing persuasive discourse would be other examples. And we're gonna see part of the reason narrative serve as a bridge core, uh, excuse me, as a bridge skill that helps move children toward proficiency with higher level, more complex forms of discourse is because it has a structure that can be taught. And that could help them to uh, then, if you will, start to access higher level literate language. So we're gonna come back to that a little bit later. And then finally, a big theme uh, that I'm a huge proponent of interdisciplinary collaboration. Let's go back for a moment to our discussion of the nature of uh, kids for whom working on oral language comprehension might be most relevant. I want you to think of those students with a mixed reading disability who might need work on phonemic awareness, work on decoding skills, and then work on broader language skills. There is probably too much there for any one stakeholder in the world of reading instruction and intervention to do alone. But if we collaborate um, and bring interdisciplinary knowledge to the table and we have a, a agreed upon a systematic division of labor, we can accomplish more working together. And I'm going to come back to that thought in a moment. Okay, a quote that I love from two influential people in the world of reading, Dorothy Bishop and Marilyn Adams. Uh, Despite growing recognition of the critical contributions that oral language skills make to reading comprehension, Keep in mind, if you note the date here, uh, uh, let's see, this goes back 30 years. Um, difficulties with oral language comprehension may go unnoticed. Kane and Oakhill, uh, researchers out of England, I believe, are also uh, of this perspective. Um, that oral language skills make a critical contribution to reading comprehension but they may be overlooked, particularly, and this is the Bishop and Adams piece of it, when students have relatively intact or strong word reading and spelling skills. So think about this, why might this be? I think there's a tendency for 
us to look at children and if they're at grade level, let's say reading passages aloud uh, or reading isolated word lists, maybe with nonsense words or just word recognition skills, everybody assumes, well, because they can decode and read the words aloud, they are a reader. OK, when, in fact, if you go back to that simple view of reading, yeah, decoding and word recognition are a, clearly a critical part of reading comprehension. But so is the, the, the broader oral language base of reading. And I particularly worry about kids who do have relatively intact word reading skills flying under the radar and going unnoticed because maybe their broader language skills uh, are, are not being considered as much as they could or should be. Um, I was saying um, to Pam before uh, uh, we started tonight that um, one of the things I appreciate about Louise Spear Swirling's work and some of her colleagues, Louisa Motes would be another example of somebody like this. They do appreciate the broader contributions that oral language make. Um, so I would encourage you, all of you, to be considering those broader oral language skills as part of a comprehensive reading evaluation. And coming back to that fourth caveat on the previous slide, uh, a great area for interdisciplinary teaming if you suspect that children have difficulties with language comprehension would be to, to, to work with your speech and language pathologists, among other stakeholders, uh, because they're often maybe focusing more on that spoken and listening comprehension piece in terms of language modalities. Okay. Now, uh, I'm going to focus uh, a fair amount tonight on sentence structure. Um, let me start with this quote. Uh, this is from Cheryl Scott. She is a speech and language pathologist and educator. I would say probably the primary researcher and educator in the country in terms of the contributions that understanding syntax and sentence comprehension makes to broader reading comprehension skills. And this is from an article she wrote for her colleagues in speech and language pathology, at least in one of our journals, uh, a little over a decade ago. And I love this sentence. It really, I think, justifies part of why I'm going to lean into this topic so much tonight. And she says, if a reader can't parse the types of complex sentences that are encountered in academic texts, no amount of reading comprehension strategy instruction will help. And why do I have this silly picture here? Um, what I often say when I'm out there teaching uh, general educators, special educators, reading specialists, speech and language pathologists is, you can teach all of the evidence-based, more cognitively oriented reading comprehension strategies until the cows come home. And if you're not paying attention to children's confusions at the sentence level, you're only going to get so far with all of that other good work in terms of cognitive um, cognitive reading comprehension approaches. So I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater here. I'm a huge fan of things like reciprocal teaching, collaborative strategic reading, questioning the author. So many of these wonderful comprehension uh, strategies that I'm sure all of you or many of you are using. So I'm not saying we shouldn't uh, value those. But what I am saying is, I think in the field, we need to be paying more attention to what is going on at the sentence level. Um, in my list of resources, you'll see an article that Donna and I published in Intervention in School of Clinics several years ago. 
And what part of what prompted me to write that article, and I wrote it for my colleagues in general education, reading and special education. Um, I remember one day in my office going to all of my books on reading instruction and intervention, many of which this audience would recognize, some of the classic texts in the field. And I went to the index and I looked under, uh, I looked for two key terms, sentences or syntax. And the majority of those books on reading instruction did not have a single reference to the topic of sentences. Um, and if they did, it was often just a passing sort of uh, oblique reference, and there wasn't a lot of attention giving, given to this topic. So this is a partial list. Um, in my list of resources, any of you that get interested in going deeper with this topic, lots of good resources that I'll share with you, many of which I've used to learn more about this topic. Um, but to get us started, I'm gonna focus on these four types of sentence structures. Um, and ideally you would have looked at the chapter before you uh, joined our, our group tonight. If you haven't, um, I encourage you to look at the chapter for more information. Uh, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to preview these four types of sentence structures that many readers do have difficulty with. Um, and I'm going to look at them from a structural lens. Then what we will do is once I've introduced these, we will circle back and then we'll start to talk a little bit what do you do in clinical practice or in educational practice to help support our kids? In other words, what would good instruction and intervention look like? But to do that, first, we've got to talk a little bit about structure. And what the literature shows is many stakeholders in the world of reading, uh, particularly reading teachers. I'm thinking of work that Louise Spear Swirling and Louisa Motes and others have done. Many teachers don't have a deep amount of training in this area of syntax and sentence structure. And even as a speech and language pathologist, you know, and we're supposed to be experts in language or specialized in language, what the evidence would show is that many of our students aren't well trained enough on this topic either. So I'm going to try and level the playing field a little bit by just doing uh, an overview. Maybe for some of you, it will be a review of these four types of structures that some readers have difficulty with. First type, passive sentences. What makes a sentence a passive sentence? In a passive sentence, the subject is acted upon. So here's an example of a passive sentence. The ball was thrown by mommy. Now, an active form that would pretty much semantically say the same thing would be mommy threw the ball. And mommy threw the ball from a processing perspective. In other words, the active voice is easier for most people to process, particularly children with language vulnerabilities or difficulties. Um, and yet, as many of you know, kids are gonna encounter the passive form in the books they're reading, whether they're narrative or expository, uh, particularly as the years go on and kids get into uh, upper elementary, middle school, high school, all of these forms we're about to go through are gonna show up more and more. So uh, passive sentence, uh, the subject, in this case, the ball, is no longer the actor or the agent. Instead, it is what is acted upon. Reversible passive sentences are a specific type of passive sentence where the nouns could be reversed. So, Deshaun was pushed by Trevor. 
Okay. And I playfully say, because I used to do recess duty when I worked in the public schools, any of you that have ever had playground or recess duty know probably what's going to happen next is Trevor's going to push back. So we could just as easily semantically say Trevor was pushed by Deshaun, and that would make sense semantically as well. So the nouns here could be reversed and of course it would change the meaning of the sentence who did the pushing and who was pushed depends on where those names appear in the sentence these cause particular confusion for many students um, in fact 50 percent of typically developing kindergartners would have difficulty processing a sentence like this um, my concern is kids that developmentally end up off track in terms of their language development. These could be kids with developmental language disorder. They could be English language learners. They could be children with language-based learning disabilities, among others. Even as they should be developmentally able to process a form like this, they will continue to lag behind and they might need direct instruction on passive sentences. So why would this be confusing? Okay, what happens is children with less developed language skills will fall back to a more basic form. So imagine where I have this sentence in red. Um, they're not paying attention to these, um, these function words that carry less semantic weight, like was and like by. And what they're focusing on is, in fact, I'm going to bring up my cursor here, Deshaun, the subject, pushed the verb Trevor, okay, the object, or, or that's how they're hearing it is subject, verb, object. So uh, let's go back to the original sentence. If I said to any of you, um, as adults with, I'm assuming pretty good language skills, Deshaun was pushed by Trevor. Who was pushed? Most of you would say Deshaun. Many of our kids would say Trevor, and here's why. They're not processing these semantically uh, less salient words. They're falling back to a subject, verb, object pattern, and basically they're processing the order uh, of the, the, the main words they're hearing in the sentence, and they're not getting that was and by change what's going on here they they make it a passive sentence um, and anecdotally uh, the very first sentence most children i'm going back to the birth to five years now in fact birth to three years um, the first sentence most children are going to produce is just that subject plus verb plus object so these kids are misinterpreting the sentence because they're not getting these how was and by make this a passive construction and they're passive they're they're misinterpreting it to say Deshaun pushed Trevor okay so that's the source of the confusion a second type of sentence our kids tend to have difficulty with um complex sentences uh that begin with dependent clauses that have um or that have dependent clauses with causal and temporal conjunctions um you'll find many of these slides the definitions might seem abstract but by looking at the examples i think this starts to make sense so think about this sentence i went because i was asked okay i went is really the heart of the sentence Okay, it's an independent clause, it could stand alone. Because I was asked tells why I went. And if you really just for a moment, I want you to focus on just the verbs 
okay? If I said to most of you, what happened first? Were you asked first or did you go first? Most of you, because of your advanced language skills, would understand, well, it, actually I was asked, then I went. What our kids tend to do if they don't have strong language skills with a sentence like this is they might process these clauses in the order that they hear them. I went first, I was asked second. And of course, if they're doing that, they're losing the cause effect relationship that's really implied here. Okay. Another way to see this is just look at the verbs went, asked. And that's what a lot of our kids do to oversimplify it. And they're not getting how this causal subordinating conjunction really changes the order of events here and therefore the cause effect relationship. This one's even easier to see. Before you eat, wash your hands. Okay. So again, if I said to most of you, what are you going to do first? You're going to know the first thing I want you to do is to wash your hands. Children with language weaknesses that aren't getting the temporal ordering effect of this particular subordinating conjunction, they're apt to process this sentence again, essentially in chronological order, the way they hear it. So they're going to think, eat, then wash. Um, it's an interesting sidebar, but many of the kids I work with with langu developmental language disorders um, or language learning disabilities, sometimes adults are very quick to, to, to think, well, they're oppositional or they're defiant, when in fact, sometimes their difficulty following directions uh, for or instructions from adults really comes back to language processing difficulties. So what's going on here? An order of mention strategy. They're basically interpreting these sentences based on the order of the verbs, and they're not getting the cause effect relationship that's implied or the chronological order of events that's implied by these conjunctions. And as we go on, you're going to see, I pay a lot of attention in my instruction to getting kids to be more metacognitive, more metacognitive about recognizing conjunctions that we use to build more complex sentences. Here's a, another type that causes confusions. A relative clause. It's a dependent clause, meaning it can't stand alone, that modifies a noun or a pronoun in an independent clause. Okay, often uh, it's going to be introduced by relative pronouns, such as that, who, and what. And it acts like an adjective. So again, Examples are instructive here. Here's a great example. The boy who lost the dog walked home. Now, imagine I drop this out, who lost the dog. The boy walked home. That is actually the independent clause in this sentence. It's a really simple sentence. The boy walked home. But what happened here is this, we could put brackets around it. This is a dependent clause that could not stand on its own. Who lost the dog? And what it does, okay, imagine there are brackets here, is it tells who lost the dog, the boy. Essentially, relative clauses act like adjectives. They give us more information about a noun or a pronoun. And in this case, the noun is the subject of the sentence, the boy. So which boy? The boy who lost the dog walked home. Now, where does the confusion come in? Again, if I said to, to most of you as adults, educators, parents uh, with uh, fully developed language skills, who walked home? you would know the correct answer is the boy. 
many of the children who I work with, and I suspect many of you work with, would actually answer, the dog walked home. What's going on here? It's what psychologists might call a recency effect. They're hanging on to and processing the last few words that they heard. So this is a common confusion uh, among children, for example, with attentional difficulties, uh, with limitations in working memory, uh, particularly phonological memory, uh, with difficulties in uh, processing speed, or even executive functioning. Any type of processing deficit that could affect children's ability to focus on and hang on to all these words uh, could leave them to just focus on the last few words they hear. We're going to call that a recency effect is the source of the confusion. Final type I want to review before I start to walk you through some, some instruction. Sentences that contain multiple clauses. So this is a book I pulled because it was referred to in uh, the Common Core State Standards that came out uh, several years ago. So I went, I took out the book from a library, and I looked at it as an example of what kids might be encountering, in this case, particularly expository texts in science curricula. Okay, uh, and this is not uncommon sentences like this. So, uh, because water molecules cling to each other like tiny magnets, a drop of water can stay in one piece, even as it falls through the air. Now, again, I want you to think about those kids, and I know many of you know these kids, and they are they're they're in your classrooms and on your caseloads with those processing limitations uh working memory attention um uh processing speed etc simply stated folks let's look at this okay we've got three different clauses here and a hell of a lot of words for our kids to process and hold on to Okay, so long sentences with multiple clauses can prove a challenge for many of our students. By the way, I did spend a summer, the better part of a summer, in a children's library looking at examples of both narrative and expository text and looking for exemplars uh, that I could use for writing and teaching about this topic. And I will tell you, this fourth type of potential confusion, that is sentences with more than two clauses, um, and we're going to see as we go on, you could have sentences with four or five clauses, particularly when you're getting up to middle and high school text, very common. And there you will encounter more of these types of sentences than the other three combined. So it's critical to teach our kids to be able to, to, to analyze and to comprehend sentences that are this long and complex. Okay, so what do we do about it? Um, I'm going to just quickly move through some examples of uh, instructional techniques. All of these are covered in Chapter 7. Uh, an additional reference is that article I mentioned in uh, a journal that's very user friendly for educators, uh, Intervention in School and Clinic. Uh, we also go into even more depth than we did in this chapter seven. So those are resources for any of you that start to maybe get interested or excited about this topic. So directed questions. These are really good for children that have difficulty differentiating between an active and a passive voice. This comes from Doug Carnine's book on direct instruction reading, and he and his colleagues out at the University of Oregon did some research to show that this works for uh, readers that have difficulty with this particular sentence type. And what you are going to do is we're going to present series of sentences 
first in the active voice and then in the passive voice. And then we're going to give students scaffolding and corrective feedback based on the answers they give us. So uh, initially, I would teach them what is the active voice. I would compare and contrast, give them some direct instruction on the passive voice. And now we're getting here maybe into the second phase where we start to do these, uh, this particular procedure after a little bit of direct instruction. So a teacher says, and I'm going to do this as if we were in a classroom, I'll say a sentence and then ask you a question. Diego found Rebecca. Who was found? student hopefully says Rebecca. Who did the finding? Diego. Okay, second set. Now listen to a different sentence. Diego was found by Rebecca. Let me say it one more time. Diego was found by Rebecca. Who was found? Of course, this is the passive form, so the appropriate answer would be Diego. And then you would say, who did the finding? Rebecca. Something very subtle happened there that I want to call your attention to. And by the way, this is an example of what I said before. I would be writing all this out or have it prepared. Um, either write it out on a whiteboard or have it prepared ahead of time to work with a, a perhaps a smart board format. Um, is I am purposely using a bold font in an underline here to make these low, these function words that don't have a lot of semantic salience, was and by, more visually salient for my learners. Because that's what's going to cue them that this is a passive sentence. Also notice, as I spoke it, so that they could get it through a listening modality, I used a little bit of extra intensity, that is extra volume, an extra prosody on those words was and by. The first time I did it with a almost exaggerated amount of intensity and prosody. The second time I tried to normalize it a little bit more. Um, and that's gonna help them to kind of focus on these as cues to passive constructions. Sentence starters. Uh, sentence starters are often going to be um, either conjunctions or uh, the um, relative pronouns that I mentioned before. And we'll look at an example in a moment. Um, and these are very good for getting kids to understand those sentences uh, that have the temporal and causal conjunctions that can cause confusion. So going back to where we were before, before you eat dinner, wash your hands. Okay, and our kids sometimes don't understand the ordering of the events. So this is what it might look like in practice. Okay, I'd probably give them a little instruction on independent and dependent clauses the different types of conjunctions and uh, relative pronouns like who and that that they might encounter. And then we can do an exercise like this. I'll write about my summer. Now, this is the teacher doing a think aloud after a little bit of initial instruction. Notice how each sentence will start with one of our sentence starters. And I don't, I'm not going to get into technical language here around subordinating conjunctions, etc. In this case, we're going to simplify it to just referring to these as sentence starters. So I write these up on the whiteboard. Now, um, imagine me writing out each of these sentences one at a time. Before we went on vacation, our car was repaired. And I might talk them through this sentence, again, using think aloud strategies. So I might even write above this word in red. First, the repair took place. Okay, second, we went on vacation. And we would process this sentence together. 
And then the next sentence, after we returned from vacation, my grandparents visited. Okay, uh, and there I might do the same type of thing. Um, returned first, visited second. Before there was thunder, we got out of the water. Got out, I might write in red above it, first. Thunder occurred second. And we would talk through these together. Then what I would do, drawing from their background experience, remember that's going to help to contextualize the language. I want each of you to write three sentences about your summer. Be sure to use each of these conjunctions or center st sentence starters, uh, one sentence for each one of these. And that's a way to start, again, to make our kids more metacognitive about how these temporal and causal conjunctions work. Sentence combining. I love this technique. Um, it is very versatile. It could be used for many different types of confusions that I've addressed. Uh, and many of you probably know this from professional development in the world of writing, where we teach kids that tend to write relatively simple, unelaborated sentences to build bigger, more complex forms, often by merging those simple kernel sentences together. Um, so it's an incredibly versatile technique. And what I want to cause, call to your attention here there is research showing that sentence combining, although many of us learn it ostensibly in the service of writing instruction, it also improves reading comprehension. And this comes back to that caveat about working across modalities. Okay, so yeah, writing is expressive language, reading comprehension is receptive language, but there is evidence that working with sentence combining improves sentence comprehension. What might it look like? And I'm aware that I'm getting short on time, so I'll probably pick up the pace a little bit here. All of you have access to these slides. Again, and these are more developed in chapter seven of Luisa's book. First, I would introduce the building blocks of a simple sentence. I love, by the way, uh, friends, working with colored, uh, colored uh, strips to build sentences. So here I have in purple the noun phrase or the subject of the sentence. The astronauts, verb phrase, gather information for scientists, okay? show kids we can build a simple sentence okay the astronauts gather information for scientists now that's probably not anything that's going to cause a great deal of confusion i'm thinking maybe third fourth fifth graders here okay but i want to teach them to be able to process a sentence with a centrally embedded relative clause. How might I do that? A different colored strip with a relative clause. Who study the Earth's atmosphere? And I could say to them, a relative clause often follows a noun and tells us more about that noun. In this case, it says who. So this is going to tell us a little more about a person. And there we go. And I would show them how we could take this simple sentence, insert this centrally embedded relative clause here, and now we've got a complex sentence. The astronauts who study the Earth's atmosphere, and by the way, I, again, I'm often using different colors and lots of arrows. So here I might stop and say, this clause tells us more about the astronauts, okay? The astronauts study the Earth's atmosphere, or who study the Earth's atmosphere, 
gather information from scientists. So I would insert this, then I would probably have them pull this out again and look at the sentence going back as a simple sentence. So in other words, I'm toggling back and forth between the simple sentence and the complex sentence and showing this relationship that all this does is tell us more about the astronauts. And that's how relative clauses kind of act like adjectives. Um, and again, it wouldn't be based on one exemplar. I might have three or four of these, preferably from the student's authentic text to start to do this type of work. Okay, and then working in the other direction, sentence decomposition. Um, and by the way, I often am doing both, building and then breaking down, building and then breaking down. It's kind of what I did here when I said, at the end of this, I would then pull out the relative clause and go back and let them see how it then becomes a simple sentence again. Okay, so this is the sentence construction okay uh and now we're going to look at the decomposition okay so this is again a sort of a an instructor doing a think aloud for the class this is a long sentence from the science book that we are reading the sentence contains a lot of information and i'm going to write it on the, the whiteboard preferably i'd have it written ahead of time Okay, now again, I think all of us would agree that's a lot of information to process. And many of our kids are encountering complex sentences like this as early as third, fourth grade. In fact, that's what the Common Core says that this, uh, this book that I took this from, uh, A Drop of Water is the name of the book, uh, would be leveled at. Okay, so then what I would do is simply deconstruct the, or decompose the sentence. Now watch me break this sentence into four shorter, I could also say simple or kernel sentences. And I would probably be doing a think aloud as I, you know, wrote each of these on the board. I won't do that for the sake of time here. Okay, but they can start to see how this big old sentence up here, each of these clauses carries what linguists or psychologists might call its own proposition, which is just a fancy way of saying each carries a unique idea. So it's a big sentence because it contains several different ideas. Um, and again, it's making our kids metacognitive that they can break a sentence like this down. I was reviewing the slides before we started tonight, and I thought probably what I might do is I would first take this sentence and underline, here's my subordinating conjunction because, Here's a coordinating conjunction, but here's another subordinating conjunction as, and I often have these on colored index cards, the coordinating conjunctions, one color, the subordinating conjunctions, another color, and maybe three or four relative pronouns, uh, such as who on a third color. So that, that gives them some Again, metacognitive awareness of those uh, relative pronouns and those conjunctions that are the building blocks. And as they can start to identify these, now they're in a position to better break this sentence down on their own. So we would go through practice like this where I would give them sentences, again, preferably from authentic text, and allow them to or guide them maybe with directed questions through breaking it down and you guessed it what i might then do is go back and have them use sentence combining to build it back up in the other direction again into a bigger more complex sentence okay um now for the sake of time i would had hoped we might have a little time to talk about narrative um, I want to leave you with this big idea. 
narratives, as I said, because they have a structure, I think many of you will recognize this. Um, these are the elements of story grammar, sometimes called narrative macro structure, that are very common in uh, the narratives that our kids are reading. Um, many kids I work with, they know the basic elements of the setting. They can tell you the central characters, maybe the protagonist, the time and the place, and they can often give me a lot of the actions or attempts in the story. And this is where they're going to need work is many of our kids aren't as descriptive in terms of these other elements of episode structure. So um, in the chapter, there's a lot of information about uh, uh, how this works, how you can explicitly teach kids these elements. Here's one of my favorite tools. I would guess some of you are familiar with it. The story grammar marker, which can be used for multi-sensory teaching. And each of these visuals or images represents a different part of story grammar. And it's multi-sensory. Kids can manipulate it. Uh, and it's a way for them to internalize this structure of a story. Uh, and because this can be explicitly taught, this idea of a story grammar, this is why narratives become a great bridge skill to other forms of literate language. Okay, um, and for the sake of time, uh, I'm not going to walk you through the six step instructional sequence. Um, as I said, I, I emphasize sentences tonight because uh, based on professional development activities I do, uh, many stakeholders in the world of reading have said to me, uh, syntax and sentence structure is an area many of us felt underprepared to teach, uh, whereas narrative tends to get a little bit more attention in the world of reading. So um, I apologize, I did run a little bit over, but Pam and colleagues, um, any questions that you maybe one or two we would have time for here? Um, they were fast and furious coming in, Dr. Zapoli, and lots of lots and lots of compliments and thanks and gratitude for your session. In fact, even my colleagues and I were thinking, we need to bring you back and do a workshop so you just yeah <laughs> stay, you know, on a little bit, stay on a little bit after and we'll see if we can make that happen but sure uh, thank you for uh for this evening it was very very uh helpful and informative so let me just get a couple questions out first yep. question was do you have a book <laughs> and then i'll go to the others is there i do not but i'm glad you led with that question because <laughs> i really did put a lot of thought into the handout that you have uh the book study reading guide, you'll see that I listed some of my favorite go-to resources, both for syntax and sentence formulation and for narrative. So when I was preparing this chapter, when Donna and I were preparing this chapter, these were some of our favorite resources that informed this work. So that, that's where I would point you toward. Okay, um, question uh, real quick, I'll just do a couple and if you sure. and you wouldn't mind uh, going to the doc later. Um, from Karen, is there a short and easy assessment teachers could use to determine student level of oral language? I'll tell you one that I am, have fallen in love with. It's I, I, I think it's wonderful and it can be used within a response to intervention or multi-tiered uh, systems of support type of framework and i did list it on my handout it's the 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 cubed and particularly the narrative language measures uh and there's a listening section it is uh evidence-based there's a ton of research that's been done and ongoing on it it is by doug peterson and trina spencer it's a lot like dibbles and ames web for those of you that are familiar with yeah. those tools. and it is free yeah i saw that i know yeah. it's free and i see carrie put that in the chat too yep. others can't see the chat but yes it's free and what it does that goes beyond dibbles and ames web in my opinion is it captures more of the elements of 
oral language that kids are might be struggling on. In other words, going back to the simple view, I think Dibbles and Amesweb are really good for the read word reading, decoding part of, of reading, but they're much weaker on the language comprehension side. Um, this, this cubed tool, which is free, um, is, is the first one I've seen that can be used for both the code-based reading skills and the broader oral language skills. Okay, I'll ask just one more because we're right there at the top of the hour, but I will send these to you. Um, uh, this is from Catherine. Speaking as an SLP, um, oops, I just lost it there real quick. This lack of language training for teachers has been a serious concern for far too long. Is Dr. Zapoli able to speak to interdisciplinary efforts to include mandatory coursework in university teacher training programs? Oh, you're speaking our language there, Catherine. <laughs> but yeah, there. you know, I, I, I can speak to in Connecticut, um there there are parent groups interestingly took the lead um and with a lot of educators supporting them and working collaboratively with them um and our state department of education uh as as um essentially the legislature ha has every few years come back and mandated more and more elements of teacher preparation, of reading uh, coursework as part of teacher ed. And part of that is increasingly, more, most recently, structured literacy. And to the degree that it's been mandated now by the legislature, um, the schools of education are needing more and more to fall in line with uh, kind of honoring best evidence and scientifically based approaches to reading. So I don't know if that answers the question or not, but I know here close to home, um, it really took getting the legislature involved and they just started actually an office within the State Department of Education specifically focused on dyslexia and reading disabilities, where there's going to be people that are really gearing up to offer more structured literacy intervention. I think both pre-service and for those of us that are out in the field that maybe would like to have gotten more information in some of these chapters in Luis's book that maybe were underemphasized. Thank you. Um, yeah. There are some efforts also underway in Pennsylvania with Chapter 49, as well as House Bill 2045. We're getting there. We may not be there where we want to be, but we're moving in the right direction. So I'm going to turn it over to Andra. But before I do, just a quick reminder for those of you who have not yet registered for the Patent Literacy Symposium, don't miss out. <laughs> June 14th to the 16th, 75 sessions, a virtual conference of the best who's who in the country for literacy. So we hope that you can join us. I'll turn it over to Andrea. And I was serious, Dr. Zapoli, about bringing you back. So <laughs> we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Appreciate everybody's time tonight. And um, I will be sending out, uh, I'm going to be sent a list of questions and I will write out some answers and those will be shared with you for those uh, who maybe uploaded a question that didn't get answered. We'll and get... uh, Dr. Hudson did uh, respond to the questions from Chapter 6 about reading fluency, and that is now in the Padlet. So sorry, there you go, Andrew. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you so much, Dr. Zippoli, for this evening's uh, session and everyone for joining us. We're so grateful for your time and expertise and deepening our knowledge of Chapter 7, Structured Literacy Interventions for Oral Language Comprehension. The recording for this presentation will be added to the Patent Literacy Resource Hub and can be found at the link we've been sharing in the chat this evening, as well as the Patent YouTube channel.